Hey everyone, uh, my name's Andy. I'm from the Finding Value Finance channel. Uh, today we have Tavi Costa with us today from Crescott Capital. Uh, I brought him online because I was scrolling through Twitter. He had a bunch of really good uh, information showing through charts and posts. So I wanted to get him on. I wanted to get his idea and his opinions on kind of the macro picture of everything and, and what he's seeing. Uh, he's got a lot of really good charts that range from commodities to the tech sector to all these different things. So I wanted to get him on and get his opinion kind of on the macro picture and we can dive in from there. So Tavi, what, what are you seeing from a market, kind of a, a market macro picture wise? Like what is your opinion of the markets at the moment? What are you seeing? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, just to step back a little bit, um, I think we've had a, a long period of time of, of disinflationary environment where cost of capital has been very low and really allow companies that are not profitable uh, to be able to borrow money at very cheap levels and be able to sustain business models that would never be sustained in, in decades like the 40s, the 70s, or the 1910s. And so we've been, to, um, we've been through this uh, period of excessive monetary and fiscal policies uh, where fiscal policy has, has gone uh, above and beyond where monetary uh, policy had to actually intervene in order to suppress interest rates uh, and almost monetize uh, the debt here in the U.S. And all those, all those different parts of the, the economy in general uh, have created a, what we think it's a macro regime change. So coming into now where we think we are and uh, what's going to look like in the following years, uh, we think cost of capital is on the rise, uh, and we think the profitability is on the way back, and fundamental analysis is on the way back. Uh, we think that the, the sectors that we saw working in the past and the very speculative parts of the market, um, where we saw especially technology uh, industries, related industries like software companies, um, most of the capital have been sucked into those parts of the economy where if you look at the long-term CapEx trends of technology companies relative to, let's say, commodity producers, you can see a major divergence between the two. And so uh, we've forgotten the basic necessities of an economy, such as natural resources in general. And so we're now in this very distorted world where macro imbalances have reached extreme levels on the multiple side of equity markets and risky assets. At the same time, we have leverage in the system like we've never had before on the overall uh, basis. And so I think uh, this is a very positive environment for real assets, tangible assets, uh, especially uh, commodities in general for the following years. And our focus has been mostly in, in exploring businesses that have been out of favor for, uh, well, not only commodity producers have been out of favor, but really explorers. And so uh, this is kind of in a nutshell uh, where I think the environment is today and, and some of a uh, little bit of the opportunities that we view here. Okay, I've got a couple of your charts that I grabbed off Twitter. Are you okay if I share some of them? Just no to problem. Because you, you, you've got a couple of things there that I would really like to, to cover and go over. Um, one of the charts that you had uh, had shown, and I'll share it right here real quick, uh, that I think is a really good one, <clears throat> is the NASDAQ breadth. Um, I, I saw this and I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Could you kind of just quickly do a run over of what this chart means and what it's saying? Yeah, I, I think if you dive into what the issue really is, is that the breadth of the market is very weak. Uh, to levels we've only seen really in the tech bubble. The tech bubble was very similar to this where parts of the market began to uh, falter. Um, and so if you look at the equity marketing you know, as a whole, uh, there's really growth of stocks is, is where the, 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 most, uh, the, the largest distortions you know, relative to prices versus fundamentals really are. And if you look at the growth stocks, you can separate them between large caps and small caps. The small caps have began to roll over, which believe it or not, it's a large majority of NASDAQ has a lot of small caps too. And so uh, if you look at now within this growth stock environment, the majority of those companies, about 50% of them are in technology businesses. Um, and then if you look at inside a technology business, uh, about 40% of those are in software companies. 
Uh, those software companies are not, you know, about 40% of them are not profitable today. So there's, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to dive into uh, what the issue really is in equity markets. As far as valuations go, uh, we haven't seen anything like this in a real long time. And this is a product of interest rates and cost of capital and the lack of alternatives of, of, of finding yield in the markets in general has really driven uh, most of the large capital allocators into risky assets, such as equity markets in general. So most of the market, most of the allocation of capital has gone to two parts of the market, technology in a large way. And then in order to hedge that position, most of those large capital allocators bought fixed income, mostly, I would say, treasuries. And so, uh, you know, that part of that is the risk parity idea, the 60-40s idea, uh, and now we're starting to see the unwind of that in a big way. And to that chart again, uh, now we have some speculative sides of the market beginning to falter in a large way. We were seeing AMC, um, GameStop. We're seeing ARK down close to 40 plus percent. Um, we have crypto. Crypto is another, an extension of the technology sector. Also, um, you know, also having issues. Uh, we have, uh, uh, well, Tesla kind of came back recently, uh, but really coming in from the small cap names is, is where you can see software stocks is another part of the market. The non-profitable parts of the, the, of the market has been, have been uh, working really, uh, have been doing very poorly, um, biotech com biotechnology companies. And so, um, there are quite a lot of signs. I think those are all bearish divergences um, that could potentially uh, drive equity markets as a whole a lot lower. So we're you now we're cautious. We've been cautious for some time. We have uh, you know we've been uh, uh, not only talking about that but positioned accordingly. So we have uh, quite a lot of short positions in equity markets in different pockets of the market. Uh, Chinese stocks is another example of a part of the equity market that have been um, also underperforming significantly now. It peaked back in February and, and, never, and never came back to, to new highs. And so, um, you know, and at the same time, when you look at the S&P 500 or equal weighted indices or large cap parts of, of the market, all of those are still new or near all time highs. And so um, I, think, I think there's quite a lot of opportunities here. If cost of capital deserves to be rising in it, we think it will. Um, I think that we'll see uh, it becoming harder and harder to justify those record multiples that we have here in, in, in overall stock indices. Okay, so if I were to make a statement, maybe I'll sum this up. The cost of capital, aka interest rates, uh, as that goes up, we're going to see a large rotation of money out of high growth uh, companies that are discounted with low interest rates where all this capital flowed into that's gonna unwind back into real assets uh, like precious metals, commodities, and, and stuff like that. Is that a, a fair statement? That's a fair statement. I think long duration <laughs> assets will have, uh, uh, will have trouble in the following years. And our research goes back to the 40s, the 70s, and the 1910s, because those are also periods of, uh, of, of uh, rising inflation. And when you look back in those times and you see what are the assets that perform well, uh, really were uh, commodities were one of them and actually equity markets did very poorly during those times. In the 40s, it did fine, but in 1910s and 1970s, it was actually down on a, in real terms. So you look at energy stocks, you look at agricultural commodities, you look at uh, precious metals. Um, so most of those have actually done very well, even the housing market that did well during that period, believe it or not, even though interest rates are rising and today we have this skepticism of people looking at, let's say, gold prices relative to 10-year yields. Um, when back in the 70s, if you look at gold versus 10-year yields, it's the same chart. Both of them went up together. Uh, in other words, treasuries are selling off while gold was going up. So uh, yeah, in, in real terms, you can see a better relationship, especially more recently. But in the 70s, it wasn't as, as close as it is today. So correlations change, and it's important to try to understand, at least have a, a, a grip on what is the regime that we're entering uh, right now. And I think policymakers are just absolutely clueless of how to fight inflation. 
And I think that they're really playing with fire here. Um, you know, if you look at the Fed dots, for instance, uh, you know, their, their expectation is to take interest rates up to 2.12% by the end of 2024. Um, you know, that's their goal to start fighting inflation, you know, coming from an emerging market. You know, we know that this is, you know, the gene is that when the gene is out of the bottle, <laughs> You, you, you can't put it back on and it's, it's you know, it, it, it impacts uh, consumer behavior and, and other things that will, um, that will change this macro environment in, in a big way. So now we're very focused on owning tangible assets right now. And I think none of us own enough of that. Uh, here, here's a question. You're, we're talking about inflation and you said a couple of different eras. What era best describes the inflation that you think is coming and where is that inflation being driven from? Well, I think there's a lot of um, forces and, and I look really in depth into each one of those. The 40s was more of a transitory environment, um, even though inflation stayed above 5% for over two years uh, and two occasions, I believe. And, and so um, it was a very... Uh, you know, volatile period where uh, we did see the suppression or financial repression was very similar to today, where we had to have low costs of capital in order to not allow the system to break, uh, given the levels of leverage at that time. Even though today, outside of government debt, the overall debt is actually significantly larger. But, um, you know, with that aside, I think there are aspects of each of those decades that are important to know. Um, let's take the 70s first. The 70s, we saw waves of inflation. So the CPI kind of built on itself and we saw the first wave is starting late 60s. And, you know, again, policymakers are clueless because we had a full decade or so of low, very low inflation. And so fiscal stimulus uh, and monetary stimulus would never create inflation in the minds of those uh, creating policies at the time, very similar to today. And then guess what? Inflation showed up. Uh, things just started to get bad. And then they had to um, they had to tighten financial conditions. And then we had an equity market crash. And so just long story short, those three waves of inflation are really caused by a lot of issues. Number one, uh, commodity prices uh, increasing. Uh, but really, the second one was a wages and salaries spiral that we saw throughout the whole decade uh, that was really, really important. Uh, and, uh, and also, we saw uh, labor uh, force participation rising in that. Now, there was some real secular trends happening at that time, uh, which could potentially happen today again. Um, I think we're at the beginning of that wages and salaries growth here in the U.S. right now in other developed economies. So that is one aspect of, of the 70s that is important to know. Um, from the 40s, um, what I think it's similar is uh, first and foremost, the financial repression situation. Uh, one thing that is completely different from back in the 40s um, is the situation in regards to uh, tax policies. The tax policies at the time were significantly uh, more, um, I guess, uh, you know, tax brackets are much higher at the time relative to today. So we have a much more aggressive tax policy nowadays, uh, which is part of the fiscal agenda in a way. Um, and we may see some changes in regards to that, but uh, as of now, that is still is, uh, in my opinion, uh, a huge part of the inflation thesis. Um, so I think there's, uh, you know, the, 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 the wages and sellers is, is what creates the cost push. Uh, the demand pull is being created by the fiscal stimulus. And the fiscal stimulus has really a lot of agendas. Um, you now, number one is the peak inequality. So uh, clearly politicians are very focused on bringing down the rich people and perhaps trying to rise up uh, the, the, the lower classes financially here in the U.S. and in developed economies. Um, like it or not, I mean, this is, this is clearly a focus of the current political leadership. Uh, uh, and so the second thing that is happening is the infrastructure development. The infrastructure development is, um, you know, which we may see, we're not seeing just yet, but it's, there, there's definitely a push towards that, uh, is kind of mixed with the Green Revolution. Um, those two uh, is what we think it's going to drive 
uh, or continue to drive the demand for things like commodities. And so the electrification in the world, the miscalculation of, of not allowing companies to explore and develop and produce natural resources, and then creating those uh, major supply and demand mismatches, uh, especially in the oil industry right now, and some others like copper and silver uh, parts of the markets and some agricultural sides too. And so all of those are going to see some, some major supply and demand mismatches is still ahead of us. Uh, that has nothing to do with final product uh, supply disruptions that, that, that are being caused uh, currently. Um, those are all parts of the issue. And then you have this fiscal and monetary uh, disorder uh, at the same time, uh, which is being caused by uh, number one, the, 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 the I think uh, it, this is going to come back at some point, uh, which is the number one job of the Federal Reserve, uh, which at this point, given where we have excessive multiples in risky assets and we have the leverage ratios uh, at the top, especially with the government and some corporations, what's going to drive here is that the number one mandate of the, the, of the Federal Reserve is not so much uh, on um, the, the stability of the jobs market or the stability of inflation. Well, those two, uh, they're clearly, well, the jobs market is fine, that's checked, but the inflation part is completely off the charts. Um, but the number one job of the Federal Reserve at some point here, it's going to be bringing back to, um, to the idea of suppressing interest rates and suppressing cost of capital. There's no way, uh, no way around this. Um, and so we've seen that since the pandemic started, and now they're trying to exit that strategy because of the inflation problem. But um, you know that that's going to be the challenge, and why we think the Federal Reserve is trapped. So uh, those are all the you know the I, it's a long answer. I'm sorry for that, but it's 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 just a one way uh, to kind of see all the inflationary problems that we're seeing. And then if you dive in and even further uh, to the natural resources part of the market, I mean, just look at the enrollment of of um, uh, Earth uh, Science. Uh, uh, programs in general. I mean, it's been in a in a secular downward trend. So it's hard to find geologists. It's hard to find anyone to work into those uh, energy companies or a precious metals businesses or or any basically any any uh, a base metal company or agricultural commodities. It's very difficult to find labor, uh, especially qualified labor, to do that. And those are all trends that take some time to change. And so it's creating a lot of inconsistencies and, and a lot of opportunities as a result. So, uh, so those are bad things, but also very positive things at the same time. You said that uh, we may go through a period of high inflation. You said they're going to try to hold rates down or suppress rates. Uh, do you think they're going to be successful at doing that? Um, historically, they have not been successful at doing that. So I, I don't I don't. You know, if I would bet on that, I would bet that they would not. But that doesn't mean they wouldn't try to do so. Um, look, right now, the issue is that if you look at the long end of the curve in the treasury markets today, you know, call it almost at 2%, a little lower than that in the 10 year, the 30 year is a little uh, more at the 2% level. So if, if we look at both of those, you know, in order to allow the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates, let's call it a 2%, uh, you know, one and a half percent without causing, without causing the, the yield curve to invert. The only way to do that is to allow the long end of the curve to, to rise. And so, you know, there's, a, there's some ways to do it. Uh, basically, I've done a lot of research on this and there's quite a lot of, there's a flood of issuances happening uh, basically a transition on the government debt side happening right now, where we're seeing a flood of issuances in the long end of the curve of the Fed, of the, of the treasury market, while we're seeing large amounts of T-bills and short-term maturities uh, actually maturing now. So basically the, the, the government is, uh, is allowing uh, its, its outstanding amount of debt to increase the average amount of, of maturity. And so, you know, what's causing this is, is that the problem of this is that uh, the Federal Reserve has been buying for the last uh, six, seven months, or even more than that, about 50 or 40, 40 to 50 percent, depending on the month of those issuances so far. And now they're exiting through the QE 
uh, taper or the taper of the QE right now that we're seeing. Um, and so the real question is who's going to be the marginal buyer of those treasuries? And no, you know, uh, no wonder we're seeing yields now rising recently as well with that. So I think there is, you know, yes, there's supply and demand mismatches in a lot of a lot of other parts of the market. But one pocket that is very critical right now is the treasury market in, in that regard. So, you know, I don't know. I think I think as of now, they're going to try to uh, uh, there's not really a way around this. I've been calling for interest rate increase to two and a half to three percent in the next 12 months in the long end. Um, and and uh, I think that after that, I think we're going to start seeing some sort of conversations about either yield curve control or some sort of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, any, any sort of uh, a, a political effort towards uh, not allowing interest rates to rise. I mean, if you're in the real estate market and you know very well uh, that that is uh, perhaps one thing that would break the whole country. I mean, uh, when we look at lower classes today, uh, the majority of their assets is actually attached to real estate. 40% of the bottom 50% of the population today owns real estate. You cannot allow interest rates in the long end to go from two to seven percent. Let's say you know you break the housing market. You can't do that. So uh, the government is aware of that, uh, and it's it's trapped at the same time. Uh, and so you know, like I said, I think there's a there's room to go to two and a half and three percent as a macro trade. And then after that, you know, if you know as part of our fund. We'll be out of that trade, and I, I think we're going to see some political effort towards controlling the rise of interest rates in the long end. Okay, so if there, here's my take on it, or how I think about it: <clears throat> if they're successful at controlling rates and they let inflation kind of run, the the forces or pressure will build at the the dollar. So the dollar is what's going to be sacrificed in that type of scenario. Is that a a fair statement? Oh, if they're successful doing that, absolutely. I think that would be a real uh, bullish environment for commodities, but really on large doses of steroids. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I think that that would be, yeah, uh, I think I think gold, gold, silver, oil, uh, even housing market would go would go <coughs> levels we haven't seen before. And uh you know, honestly, there is there is certainly um, uh, I wouldn't call it a risk, but a prob high probability of that scenario actually happen. Um, you know, we don't know what are the measurements the government's going to take. Um, you know, what if they decide to really monetize the debt in 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 the future? I I don't know, but I, I it feels like that levels of debt that we've reached right now. And the problems with imbalances that we have in equity markets, and uh, and also uh, with uh, the the debt amount in the government side, I, I just don't know how we're not going to see a winter here. <laughs> you know, if 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 they allow interest rates to um, to naturally go to the levels that they should be uh, without any manipulation. So um, I don't know. I I think that that's that's. Your your set scenario that you're referring to is is the whole reason why the Federal Reserve is trapped, um, and there are no answers for how to fix that problem. Uh, so when we start talking about those issues, it's almost like well, you know, it, it it sounds complicated because it's just there there is no answer for this, and the only answer for uh, most uh, individuals, in my opinion is to be aware of those problems and perhaps position themselves accordingly and, and maybe make money out of this and instead mm -hmm. of instead of lose money through inflation. And you know, it's gonna take some time for people to figure that out, unfortunately. So when you talk about positioning, we've got this macro picture. Inflation, uh, interest rates will potentially rise. If they don't rise, <clears throat> we'll see a weakening dollar. How would one capitalize on that? What, how, how do you play this macro picture investment so, wise? So um, I'm just going to look at uh, what we've been doing in our macro fund, because that's more of a flexible uh, vehicle to do things in general. About, let's call it 80% um, of our long book. Uh, so all the things that we've been buying, 
Uh, 80% of that has been uh, focused on buying companies that have high quality um, properties uh, with uh, minerals um, in, in those properties uh, through large deposits that are very economical and also high grade that can do well in a, in a bull market or a bear market of those minerals, regardless of the price, even though we do have a view about the price of those minerals and we think they're going to be multiples of where they are trading today, silver being a great example of that. And so that's the large portion of it. It's, it's owning tangible assets. It's owning, you know, rather than buying gold and silver, it's owning gold and silver in the ground. It's owning copper in the ground and, uh, and other minerals too. Even uh, we have uh, exposures to, uh, uh, to oil and some other agricultural commodities uh, that are part of the book. That's the long side of the book. Um, and then, and then uh, the way we see is that, is that there, there are quite a lot of ways to hedge uh, the other parts. Uh, one way is uh, that I think it's important is to have that interest rate uh, hedge. I, I do think there is a risk for that. I think junk bonds are completely mispriced. Um, I, think, I think you can, you can have a, a, you know, add put options on things like JNK, HYG, those ETFs. Um, are, in my opinion, ways of, uh, of looking for uh, protection uh, in, in terms of uh, corporate, uh, especially junk bond yields uh, rising from here, uh, being caused to uh, rise as well uh, as a result uh, cost of capital. Um, I think there is a risk for the entire developed market, which is a little bit of a more complex trade, uh, but you can find, you know, if you look at across the world, um, as far as, let's say, producer prices right now. Um, so you have classic deflationary uh, examples like Japan um, that are now with uh, PPIs at the largest levels in 40 years. So you have Spain, you have Italy. Spain, I think it's, uh, you know, PPI is at about 33% year over year. You know, you have, this is mind boggling. I mean, I've never seen this before. Uh, none of us, by the way, this is, you know, data proven. You look at the data, we've never seen this before. Uh, Italy, the same situation. You have Germany showing very similar patterns. And at the same time, you look at the, the, the yields of those bonds that uh, are now trading as some of them in negative levels, nominal terms, not real terms, and nominal negative levels. And so, um, you know, there's a, quite a lot of opportunity in that side of the market. So we've been short some of those. Uh, sovereign, uh, uh, sovereign debt in general. We've we've had a few ways of of shorting those right now, um, and that that's I mean I, I would say that that's the big bulk of the portfolio right now. Uh, and then we have obviously some short positions in long duration assets uh, where could be impacted by that cost of capital rising. Those are would be short software companies um, in a large way. You know companies trading at 50, 60 times sales. You know, that's not an environment where those companies can survive. No, I wouldn't say they're going to go bankrupt, but they need to be re-rated uh, at more appropriate levels. Um, let's see um, some other issues that we may see. Uh, it's, it's difficult to find some heavy balance sheet names, um, you know, companies that have a ton of debt, uh, companies that have very uh, low uh, free cash flow relative to number of employees. Uh, why do we look at that? Uh, because we think the cost of employees or cost of labor is going to rise. So we're looking for uh, margin squeezes in general. Um, and so we have a large book of very diversified shorts in general here. So, you know, it's, it's one way we've been playing this. Uh, and, uh, and, and we think it's going to play out beautifully. Now, you look at that commodities to equity ratio is, is if there's one chart anyone should be watching, that's the chart. Uh, that's the most relevant chart nowadays. It tells the entire story uh, in one single chart. And that chart right really is-, is that uh, it? Yeah. Or, or, uh, or right here. Yeah, that's it. Uh, that's it, yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and that's, you know, at a 50 year low, um, you know, you look at that chart, I think there is a, uh, a great rotation uh, upon us where we may see uh, inflows coming into uh, those commodity-related um, businesses relative to 
the parts of the market have been very expensive technology or even heavy balance sheets name uh, balance sheet names that have been um, that may have issues uh, with uh, with the cost of capital rising in general. So uh, those are all ideas uh, that we've been thinking about and implementing in our portfolio. When you when you said you might have some wage growth or you might have uh, expenses start to increase, would royalty companies be a good play uh, since they are basically very large cash flows per employee? They have very low employees. They have no no exposure to uh, rising input costs or anything like that. What's your opinion on royalty companies and playing this through those? Well, look, I think I think royalties. You know, first of all, as a business model, you're right. That's those are companies that will be protected by that. Uh, but that's just one factor that that we should be uh, considering, um, indeed. Uh, but I, I think that it, looking at the entire. Uh, uh, especially, you know, our, our expertise is much more in the precious metal side, but looking at the precious metal side specifically, which is very similar to copper, by the way, and, and other base metals, um, it really depends on, number one, I think you have to ask, a few, uh, answer a few questions when you're an investor in that space. Where do you think you are in the cycle? Uh, do you feel comfortable, um, you know, navigating in an illiquid space? is another part. Um, do you think, um, you know, where are the largest imbalances today uh, are definitely in the side of exploration in our opinion. Um, certainly, you know, uh, certainly there is enough, uh, not enough, but I think we're just gonna be a lot more. But if you look at the, the entire industry, uh, the royalty part and also the producers side of the market, are certainly where the focus has been for many, many years. And um, the liquidity profile is much larger. The consistency of free cash flow is much larger as well. And then you have some uh, financially savvy folks um, really diving into the developers side of businesses that have already a deposit and they're trying to figure out how they will start mining that deposit. And so you can make calculations of how much capex you're going to need um, and how much uh, free cash flow they will be able to generate from here. Uh, what are the right multiples you should put on that company? Uh, is it cheap? Is it is it ex is it expensive? So quite a lot of people doing that, but very few people being um, you know focused and I would say very a uh, real lack of smart money into. Uh, real geology where uh, you're looking for a, a real, you know, buying a piece of land, uh, looking for uh, natural resources in general uh, by exploring high risk, uh, incredible returns if you hit the right way. And so the lack of participants in that part of the market is creating very large inconsistencies and, you know, in our opinion, very inconsistent bets, meaning, um, uh, meaning very inefficient market where you're seeing very large intercepts and high probability of, of, of success not being rewarded in the market, uh, different than, you know, developers and producers and royalty businesses. So it really depends if you don't know anything about this industry and, and you just want exposure to it. Yeah, royalties are probably your safest bet. Um, you know, but if you are at the early innings of a market um, and you think that that's the way to go right now, it, I, I would say the explorers is where you have the largest um, the returns over 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 time. If, if you if you if you time it, if you identify that you are at the early innings of a, of a bull market. Yeah, which which I think we are. <clears throat> at least that's my opinion. Um, if we're looking at the exploration companies, what risks or, or things do you consider? Uh, one of the things that scares me with some of these very small explorers is they're very concentrated to say one area in one country. And if that one thing, if something were to happen in that one country, it would, it would wipe them out kind of, you know, quite rough uh, if, if they were to get wiped yeah. out or nationalized or something, or if taxes yeah. were to change or, or something were to happen to it. Um, so what, what risks do you see to, to some of the exploration companies um, 
that you'd want to evaluate before getting into some of these explorers? I think jurisdiction is in a lot of ways um, a price question uh, and a value question, but there are exceptions to that rule. And those exceptions are actually, I shouldn't call them exceptions because they're actually quite large. There are parts of the world that we Crescat don't invest uh, or at least avoid it at all costs, unless, unless there's value to be found uh, for reasons where the prices are really depressed relative to what we think we could potentially find and sell that asset prior to having issues with, with it, uh, given the jurisdiction risk. So majority of our assets is in Canada, is in uh, the US, is in Australia, is in Finland. Uh, we've been um, avoiding uh, some areas like Mexico. We've been avoiding, even though we do have positions, we've been avoiding um, adding positions uh, in that region. I've been avoiding um, other parts of the world. Um, Argentina, we never invested there. We don't have any investments in Chile. Um, um, some parts of Asia, uh, communist countries, we don't usually invest in those. Uh, uh, we do have an investment in uh, a very large investment in, uh, in Bolivia. Um, it's a country that actually um, is, is actually very favorable for mining politically uh, and historically too. Um, we've had, you know, one of the largest silver producers, um, San Cristobal uh, mine has been, uh, is, is in Bolivia and uh, it's been, uh, been owned for uh, international uh, uh, corporations as well. And so we've had that link with uh, foreign investors being able to uh, build uh, large projects in that region. Um, the risks of investing in the space um, are quite vast. I mean, there, there are a lot of things you have to consider. Uh, don't get me wrong. But the, the number one thing is starts from the places where we avoid. Um, you know, we get a lot of very great projects in places like Africa, and we just have to, you know, uh, uh, move on. I mean, it's, it's just not worth the, 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 the capital and the, the focus into those stories. Um, the other part of it that we looked at uh, quite a lot is, is the economical value of that deposit that we think uh, that company has, um, where, you know, number one, uh, what stage we are um, in, in that of, of the discovery phase. And we've been trying to quantify or systematize what some folks call the Lausanne curve, which is the discovery part of the Lausanne curve, uh, where you're really trying to figure out what is the ultimate value that a company will reach at the peak of the discovery success of that project. And so, um, you know, when we think about entering a position and exiting a position, the idea really is, have we reached the ultimate value we think there is in that ground? And how do you figure that out? Well, you got to figure out dilution. You've got to figure out the probability of discovery, the grade of that discovery. Um, the biggest misconception we hear about this industry, especially in the exploration space, that a lot of, you know, we see a lot of people making mistakes in this part of the industry is to look for large deposits that have very low grade, supposedly with very large um, leverage to gold and silver prices or any mineral. The issue with that is that uh, it is already a very risky um, operation in general. I mean, there's risk of even a very successful team to uh, to be uh, to reach uh, those uh, a successful level of discovery. Um, there's you know there's no shortage of risks that could uh, come into play in the middle of that process of the discovery process. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that that's one of the biggest mistakes that we've been avoiding uh, is, is to actually look for uh, companies that provide uh, projects that actually have a very profitable um, um, a profile in general uh, with very high grade, 
uh, in areas that are mineable, in areas that we can actually politically be able to build a project um, that are perhaps close to other companies that own a mill or some sort of other infrastructure that may help to uh, guide that company to uh, to not go through the issues of the th uh, th uh, throth of the development phase that has been you know well known and very difficult to invest. So there's a lot of issues to uh, to consider uh, when you're looking at those. And I think that the, the beauty of the market right now is the fact that you're finding a very incredible um, intercepts in in companies doing very good job uh, uh, exploring, uh, but are not being rewarded accordingly. You know, keep in mind back in 20, 2010 and other bull markets in gold, some of the intercepts that we're seeing today, you know, we would see gold, we would see those companies quadruple in prices. They're only going up 20, 30% on, on the back of those results. So this is a real opportunity for a fund like ours that has been that have the the, the long term mentality capable of buying up to twenty percent of a business that trades at a, a twenty million market cap today. Um, you know, raise capital, buy them out at a twenty percent or so stake, huh, and then you know help them to actually continue to succeed on their exploration um, um, uh, project in general. So. There are a lot of risks that are not quantifiable, such as, you know, the level of the uh, geological team and the people that are behind, you know, unfortunately, that's very subjective and, and there's no way to really measure those. Uh, and I think it, it really comes with uh, the network and understanding the industry very well. Our approach is to own a very large, major uh, I guess, a, a very diversified portfolio. We own over you know, 80, 90 companies today um, and, uh, and, and let them grow, let them, let them grow in size as they succeed um, and make sure that we own a sizable position in those that we think that are actually in that acceleration point of discovery phase. Yeah. So you're, <clears throat> when you speculate on these explorers, are you buying them based off of the management team or did they already hit something like they, they, they stuck a drill in, they found something, but they can further define what that is. is are you taking those kind of approach where it's like, hey, they've got something, we just don't know how big it is. What, what are you kind of zeroing in on or, or a mixture of both? A mixture of both. I think the small bets where we buy into a company sub 5 million, sub 3 million, sub 2 million are in the, in, in, um, Prop properties that have either a, a history of that we like or have a proximity to a project that we like or have um, some sort of um, geological survey that we think is should be follow up on. Um, and so those are all, or maybe just a whole geological case to why we think in that region, may we may find something. If the price is cheap um, and the team is uh, is is, in our opinion, uh, qualified to do the job, which is rare nowadays, uh, we will uh, do an investment in in that in that company. And then we have the other companies in the fifteen to twenty five to even thirty million, um, you know, market cap range, where. They've had maybe one or two or three successful uh, drill programs, and uh, and the market is just not rewarding uh, them as they should. And and we think the probability of them continuing to be successful in finding um, discoveries, uh, f uh, uh, defining that discovery, is 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 really high. And so we like to own those companies. And then we have those others that we've owned. Um, all the way down to from 20 to 5 million, even uh, now up to, you know, depending on the case, 300, 400, uh, or even a billion dollar companies uh, that we own pre IPO, uh, that we continue to back those companies if we think they have not reached uh, the ultimate value of that, um, that we think there is in the ground 
of that of minerals. And so it, it all depends. And, and uh, we have Exodus, some companies, but most of them we want to own to the on, on the long term and, and see it uh, to fruition, especially through production. And when you evaluate these companies, do you do you hire like a geologist or do you have a geologist on your team or something to help you figure out how to invest in these companies? That's the beauty of it is the lack of geologists and the lack of expertise in the space is precisely what's creating the also lack of smart money uh, into this part of the industry and what creates those inconsistencies and inefficiencies that are so great uh, for an investor like ourselves. And so, uh, at least in our opinion. And so, yes, uh, we've done, uh, we have a partnership with uh, Quentin Henney, which I think it's the most successful geologist uh, in the world for, uh, for exploring, uh, especially precious metals and base metals. Um, he is, um, he was uh, very involved for people that don't know that with the Foster View uh, deposit, uh, where um, he was able to, uh, uh, it was an, an extension of, of that deposit where uh, Quinton was involved and designed the drill program at that time. Uh, what basically on the back of those incredible results uh, that he was able to, uh, uh, to be behind uh, uh, through, uh, through the, the, the financing of, of Eric Sprott at the time, uh, which was backing Quinton, um, was able to create Kirkland Lake. Uh, one of the largest miners today. So, uh, you know, and some people made, made billions of dollars in that, on that transaction. So, um, you know, Quentin has been involved with a lot of um, discoveries in the past. Um, and now including a lot of the discoveries with Cresket, uh, we've had uh, a lot of new discoveries recently, new found gold, probably one of the, uh, probably one of the largest uh, and most uh, successful discoveries uh, in North America uh, of the last uh, years or so. Uh, we've had SK Mining uh, in the Golden Triangle, uh, putting out some incredible results looking like SK Creek number two. We have a Loro, a polymetallic deposit uh, that looks a lot like a, uh, a massive, um, uh, you know, uh, also silver discovery, um, which has a lot of silver in, in, in that deposit, most likely. Um, we have Cabral Gold in Brazil, um, you know, probably, uh, you know, a significant amount of ounces of gold as well in that. Um, you know, the list is very long, Arizona Metals, um, you know, quite a lot of companies that we've had success investing. And now we have those incipient discoveries that we're very, um, you know, focused on where we think they're going to be the next uh, new found golds and new SKs. Uh, of this year. And so uh, that's really the goal is to, uh, is to work with Quentin and fund uh, basically most of the companies that he has vetted on the geology side. And then we come in uh, to negotiate the deal and make sure, uh, do the due diligence on the company in general and the management team to make sure um, that all the boxes check uh, for an investment uh, from the Kreskit side. And as I'm guessing, your favorite sectors are gold and silver or those types of related sectors. Um, <clears throat> can, you, can you tell me a little bit about this supply cl cliff that's coming in gold? I know that you've mentioned it before on Twitter. What, what, what is that about? The, the supply cliff in gold is more measurable than <clears throat> silver and copper because uh, the numbers are uh, more accessible. And uh, what you find there is the lack of exploration happening in the industry for so many years and the, the, the declining CapEx trends in the precious metals uh, industry as a whole and the conservatism of capital spending in general has caused a lot of issues in this industry. And so what we're seeing now is that in order to continue to uh, produce uh, at the levels that we're seeing in most of those uh, companies in a gold and silver uh, space and even copper again as part of this too, uh, what we're going to have to see is that uh, they're going to have to replenish those reserves. Otherwise, they're going to see a major supply cliff because we're not seeing new discoveries, uh, large new discoveries 
uh, that are ready to go to production anytime soon. And so uh, that is going to be a problem and a challenge for the large, the major companies in this industry that we think they're going to have to be forced to buy a lot of the high quality um, exploration names. And so even though we think that, you know, when you look at the cash balance of the major companies, uh, it's, you know, the they're building up their cash balance. It's not, it's at, it's at better levels that used to be, but it's not perfect just yet. But the free cash flow growth is, is at levels we haven't seen before. And so if they can sustain, and if gold prices just stay where they are, the, 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 the amount of cash those guys are going to be making as far as being able to build a cash balance to then uh, make those acquisitions will be uh, very essential to our thesis in the exploration side. And that's, that's why I think, um, you know, while people are very focused in the, in, the, in the price of gold and silver that have not been performing so well, the fact that gold prices have kept at around 1800 is exactly what we need. It's, it's, it's allowing us to continue to accumulate assets in, you know, that we think are very high quality projects that are still cheap you know, very depressed historically. Um, and uh, while we're seeing those companies build up cash uh, and then be able to purchase those companies from us in the, in the following years as we develop them to become new discoveries. And when we look at the amount of, of drilling happening in Greenfield worldwide, we're not seeing much of that. And so that is the fundamental problem in this industry is that Greenfield's being developed there are not many of those. And also when you look at the, the, the latest large developments of mines in, among the major companies or any company really uh, in, in the gold and silver space, we haven't seen any in the last years or so, including uh, base metals too. So I think there's quite a lot of um, opportunities on that. Uh, and when you start thinking about it, it's really on the exploration side uh, that I think the focus has been, you know, you think about every dollar that is coming into the equity market, global equity market today, about five cents is going to commodity producers. Only 9% of that is going to precious metals. And then you extrapolate that even further. How much of that is going to um, exploration? It's nothing, basically nothing. And so at some point we, we need to see uh, that, uh, you know, that pendulum swinging back uh, to more normal levels. And when that happens, it drives liquidity to the industry and it will, it will change the entire environment. So there's a lot of ways to think about this, but that's it's just one way to do it. How, how close do you think we are to this, this swinging of the money coming to, from, I should say, from bonds and stocks and wherever else into commodities and maybe even precious metals? You, what what kind of time frame? And I know it's a difficult one uh, to ask. And is it? I'm obviously what I'm doing is I'm positioning first and just waiting for this to happen. So uh, yeah. what's what's your opinion on that? And and refining your view too, uh, and, and and finding better positions. You know, I I want to look back three years from now and think that my portfolio now. Um, you know, has improved significantly, but, but you're right. And, and the, the time frame is, is, um, is hard to think, but, but I, you know, if I would, I, I just find it difficult uh, to believe that we're going to see software and technology leading the way in the next five years. That on itself is already a change of capital flows. And we're already seeing Look, EMPs, um, exploration and production, oil and gas companies had their best year in 30 years in 2021, in 30 years. So certainly that great rotation has already began. The, the, the question really is, you know, um, at what point do we see a major transition? But I think it's already happening. I don't know if it's going to be a slow course towards commodities and out of those names. Um, but it certainly is, you know, goes back to that value versus growth as well. Because a lot of the natural resource companies fall into the value category, 
while most of those other hyped speculative side of the market certainly is in the growth side. So I don't know. I don't know when is it going to take, how long is it going to take, but I, I think going back to that uh, commodities to equity ratio, those, those uh, developments tend to take a decade. Uh, and so, you know, can a majority of that happen in three years, two years, one year? Sure, it could happen, um, but I don't have that answer. And I think the best way that I can uh, prepare for that is to accumulate assets, uh, especially in the tangible side, tangible asset side, as much as I can, high quality, refine my views about this, uh, you know, continue to research and, 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 and find the best quality companies in that space, best management teams, back them up and, and, and continue to, you know, raise capital uh, to put into uh, this industry as much as we can until we see the change. And while I think majority of the market is too focused on, oh, gold is not moving, gold is going to be replaced by Bitcoin, and that doesn't matter. I mean, that's just, it's just meaningless, right? Um, I think there's, there's a lot of greater, a, a lot more a greater moves happening in the sidelines that people are just ignoring. And, and we think these transitions that take a long, take long to, uh, uh, to play out and unfold um, will create a lot of opportunities for us. So now we're really focused in this strategy. And I, I think it's going to be, um, you know, I think there, we're going to see incredible uh, 10 years ahead. That's the way I like to think about it. It's probably the best and, and most exciting um, uh, opportunity I've seen in my career. Yeah, I agree. Um, one thing I do want to touch on is we've got an energy crisis over in Asia and Europe. Natural gas prices are going through the roof. Um, they're having electricity shortages. Uh, I think it's starting to hit in the United States. We can see our natural gas price starting to turn up quite dramatically. Is there any risk with energy costs or energy or the quantity of energy and the mining companies in general? Is this, is this energy crisis going to spread kind of all throughout the world and almost and almost be kind of a higher risk for the mining companies versus say, just buying the physical metal itself and saying, okay, I've got no risk from an energy perspective or anything like that. What, what's kind of your views on it? So the funny thing about energy relative to other parts of the commodity market is that the cycles of energy are much shorter. And a lot of times you see those spikes that create upturns and downturns um, that are you know, separated from the overall commodity cycle a lot of times. And to answer your question, I think that um, anything like that would result in much lower production and in natural resources in general. But the beauty of what we are doing is that, especially open pit projects, by the way, open pit projects would be the, the ones that would get hurt the most because they're you know, a significant portion, maybe depending on the project, 40 to 40 percent, 30 percent of their of their costs is, is energy related. Um, so it's going to depend on the project. But uh, open pit projects are usually uh, the most exposed to uh, this issue that you refer to. Uh, the beauty of what we're doing is the fact that um, energy costs is not a huge part of exploration. Uh, and so, you know, that, that part is, is, is the nice thing about it. The issue that we're facing is the fact there's a lack of labs, <laughs> a lack of infrastructure in, in general of drill pads, uh, drills in general, people that know how to drill. Um, those are the issues we're facing uh, because um, those exploration companies have a real shortage of labor and also a real shortage of materials to perform in general. So, uh, it's forcing us to be think outside of the box and be quick um, and, you know, make sure uh, we have everything line up for um, the drill program, um, you know, way ahead of most other folks. And again, you know, being being a fund with a, a big team of people thinking about all those things allows us to uh, uh, to have that uh, competitive advantage, I think. Um, now, I think that there's uh, certainly a risk of that. And I, you know, I was looking at a Bloomberg poll of the big tail risks for 2022. Um, and the biggest ones are inflation. The second one was 
I believe was. Um, there you go. Uh, I got it. Oh, there we go. Sure. Uh, the second one was um, the virus, right? The pandemic. Uh, yep. And it's almost like you should be concerned about the very bottom of that list uh, because uh, usually Wall Street is is backward looking. Uh, they are always looking at things that have worked in the past and magnifying those trends as they will continue to work uh, against them. And that's not that I don't believe in inflation. I just gave you a whole thesis on inflation that I think will it's, it's here to stay. Uh, but I don't think that that's necessarily uh, the type of inflation uh, that the uh, that these folks are concerned about. I think the type of inflation I'll be concerned about is what you just said is oil prices, uh, which are already significantly higher from a year ago. And the half of the, the Wall Street uh, folks and, and, and Federal Reserve members are hoping to see uh, inflation to peak in the first and second quarter. Uh, and that's not what oil, price, uh, oil prices are showing in, in as a whole right now. <laughs> um, so, and, and I would say the biggest concern I have also is um, with, with, uh, with food prices. You know, agricultural commodities for me are one of the parts of, one of, the, parts of the market that I think are uh, really undervalued. I'm ready to uh, to have an explosive move to the upside and could drive this whole inflationary story again. But you know the risks are are, are those along with valuations of tax stocks, uh, interest rates. I think it's another risk, um, and and those are you know those are more of uh, uh, liquidity issues that that we may see uh, that can create problems and you know kind of surprising not to see oil. Uh, I don't think I saw oil on that list. Correct me if I'm wrong. No. Yeah, that's that's funny, right? I mean, it's how how in the world is not in that list, um, <clears throat> but uh, or 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 even technology in general. You know, Arc down forty plus percent. I mean, that's this industry is brutal. You know, you go from hero to zero very quickly. By no means I'm saying Arc is going to zero. I'm just saying. It's easy to lose your credibility in this industry, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and it's uh, it's part of the process to uh, uh, to endure those periods of of pain uh, when when you are having bad performance, and you know, everyone goes through that in in some part of their career, and we all have to, uh, uh, you know, we all get tested on our our thesis uh, at some point, and so you know, I think Arc is is having that issue now. And it will be a question of how they uh, how they react to that. Uh, you know, do they really think there is a macro regime change, or this is you know uh, another opportunity for them to be buying those assets that are uh, coming off from from their highs uh, of February or so when they reach their peak? You know, obviously we have different views on that. Me, myself, and 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 Kathy Wood. So, um, anyways, uh, those. No, are I, I totally I totally agree with that. <laughs> um, yeah. interest rates going up is not going to be friendly to her fund. That's, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so do, do you have anything else to share? Um, yeah, you know, I've, I've, that's a lot of, a lot of information to, to digest there. Uh, any other closing statements or anything else that you'd like to share that you think is important for, uh, perhaps our viewers? Um, yeah, I think the way I approach all this is, is from, a. uh, probabilistic manner, I guess. Um, you know, I, I think I think there is a high probability uh, we're entering an inflationary environment, which is going to create a lot of questions to uh, a trapped uh, policymaking uh, setting of how are they going to choose to behave in that place where will they allow long-term rates to rise to a certain level Will they not do that and actually suppress rates from here or try to do so and allow inflation to rise even further? Will they fight inflation with tooth and nail and you know have issues with liquidity and cause issues with the economy and equity markets? So those are all questions you have to try to answer uh, if you're an investor today. But long-term, those things matter, but they don't matter really. I think what really matters is the fact that the, the situation of being trapped 
uh, creates one of the most bullish environments for tangible assets that I think we've ever had. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a central bank that is not capable of doing anything to fight inflation. And so uh, this is extremely bullish for um, commodities, even if they have a pullback, let's say, uh, uh, even you now we're seeing the popularity of those assets uh, come in. And so it would be normal to see some sort of pullback if, if we have some. Um, and if we do, you know, those are all opportunities for the long term because I think I think that trend is here to stay. And uh, and I think you know it's important. You know, I am in a niche part of the market, mostly in precious metals and base metals, but that doesn't mean that's only part of the market that will work. You know, I think there are very smart people doing things in agricultural parts of the market or energy, and you know, the list goes on and on. Yourself and the real estate. I think the list is, the list is 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 long, but um, you know, being mindful of those boundaries of the macro regime of, that we are in or likely in uh, for the next uh, five to ten years. Okay, well, you know, I'd really like to thank you for coming on, Tavi. You've been a, a great guest. Um, thank you for coming on the channel. I appreciate it, and you're welcome on anytime if you'd like to to come back. Um, so so thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye.